I'm in the frame? Okay, thank you. <laughs> it has a mind of its own, and so if, if you set it right, it will, it will track something. And the trouble is, well, if I set it to track the ceiling, it did a really good job last class keeping, keeping on the ceiling. Well, we um, are doing American pragmatism. We did Nietzsche and the Ubermensch um, last class. And the, the one that I really wanted to focus on is William James because he's really a contemporary of Nietzsche. Uh, Nietzsche dies in 1900, is actually fairly young when he does that. Uh, James dies in 1910. He's in his, uh, I think, late 60s, maybe late 68 or something, which I think was a, a fairly old age at that time, um, much older than Nietzsche. Um, but they lived through a lot of the same kinds of philosophical experiences. Well, if you remember, Nietzsche, uh, you know, felt you know um, drastic uh, um, philosophical change as a young man, going to school and realizing that all of his beliefs as a young man were were wrong, uh, and then you know how how did he uh, react react to that? And he was quite ill a lot of the times, and he was also very desperate. Um, but he came up with some fantastic things, of course, great literature, as far as uh, lots of people are concerned. Um, um, and by the way, one of the odd things was he wasn't considered a philosopher for quite some time, remember? Uh, by American and British philosophers, they thought he was more of a, an author you know, writing interesting stuff, if you like that kind of thing, uh, more than they thought he was a philosopher. Um, William James was on the, uh, you know, the cusp of the beginnings of psychology. In fact, he's officially the first uh, professor who gave a psychology course that was called psychology at Harvard. Um, and he had been doing physiology before that. And as if you, you read what they considered physiology at the time, physiology psychology and philosophy that are like you know all all lumped together really um, there wasn't quite there wasn't a faculty difference um, between that although there was for the philosophy department the physiology was different than philosophy what what motivated um, William James was his um, his childhood I mean his father was uh, also an author and um, perhaps you would call him a, a quasi-theologian. Um, his interests were on religion. This was Henry James Sr. Um, and you have to say Sr. because remember William James, who was the oldest son of Henry James Sr., had a brother who was two years younger named Henry James, who uh, was at the time much more famous than his older brother William, because he was an author of novels and short stories and things, and really wrote a, a lot of very American novel. I mean, he's he's the novelist that, that you know a lot of people study as um, as American novels. I, I remember in the Russian class, I asked Gospodja Furman, my my teacher for a while, uh, who her favorite American author was, and she said Henry James. Henry James. Ah, oh, how Russian. <laughs> you've ever read Henry James' works? And they feel almost like an American version of Dostoevsky. You know, they're, they're that you know, intensely detailed about uh, personal uh, development and character and, and stuff. Um, but uh, um, the father, Henry James Sr., uh, was wealthy. Uh, because his father, William James, William Henry, Henry, William, William Henry, <laughs> the very creative family, uh, passed, passed these names on, um, uh, had gotten the wealth from his father. And when he was a young man, he had a religious experience. 
uh, that he referred to as a vastation, which if you think of devastation, right, the word devastation, they're using the word vastation, meaning it was like a devastating event to him. And he felt it was evil and that, you know, he was scared to death by some sort of demon, uh, you know, in the dark near him. And, and you know, he just never quite recovered from that, uh, you know, for a while. Well, a long story short, the whole family, we think, in retrospect, although you can't really be sure because they're, they're dead and gone. Uh, so we're just reading, you know, their letters and the experiences they describe that they have apparently all had bipolar uh, issues. <laughs> you know, at least according to, I, I, I pulled up um, this video here by Dr. Um, Kay Redfield. I think I'm at the right spot. And what struck me in particular as a psychologist was that we had moved a very, very long way from the days of David Hume and William James, who had always hoped and thought as psychologists and as thinkers, philosophers, that it was reasonable to try and understand passion. It was reasonable to try and comprehend imagination. And it was reasonable to try and grapple with human greatness. That we had become so um, inward oriented and so pathologically oriented that we had forgotten this. So what I... Uh, so I just wanted to remind you of her if you're interested, because she's fascinating and dealing with this. And notice that this book uh, that she's talking about was exuberance. Uh, and the, the issue for bipolar, or people that experience bipolar, polar, that problem, uh, they have, it's also manic depressive. Uh, and the mania, mania is an exuberance. You're just absolutely, you know, fascinated with something, concentrating on it. You can't calm yourself down, you know, you're just basically emotionally high about something, uh, and then boom, you know, months later, there's a crash, and you're at the very, you're at the bottom, and, and from what I understand, mostly from her books on the subject, because she had it herself and almost died from it, um, is, is that it starts out in your late teens, perhaps, or early 20s, you have your first uh, manias and then your uh, se severe depressions and they get higher and lower as you as you as you go um, depending on you know the individual um, and there are apparently lots of folks that have this what what she's done in her literature is going back and look at other individuals that we know about like William James like Soren Kierkegaard like Tolstoy uh, I almost, you know, everybody that's famous, you could almost start wondering about, you know, well, you know, they, they had this passion that they put into their work, and as a result, you end up with, you know, Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, you know, you know, or Napoleon's, you know, uh, you know, any, anybody thinking of seeing the new movie Napoleon? The French hate it, by the way. <laughs> I'm thinking, yeah, I'm thinking of watching it as well. Uh, I know few people online who've actually watched it um, and I'm watched it. Yeah, I watched a few like clips and all that that people have recorded. Um, yeah, I've not heard anyone though say that Napoleon had bipolarity. I, I don't know. Um, I think I think he might have been autistic and might have been spectrum. That could be. That could yeah, be. Because there's there's a lot of moments it's, throughout his yeah. life, uh, especially It's reading, also like, by the way referred to as extreme maleness. <laughs> you hadn't heard that? No, I have not heard that. There, there are some uh, females that have have that, but but it seems like that's primarily a male uh, issue. And, and I, I suppose if they can get into the genetics of it, you might find that the females that do have it tend to have uh, a lot of male characteristics, perhaps. Yeah, I know um, there's a high correlation between autism and gender dysphoria. Yeah. yeah especially yeah. in women. Or, well, yeah, if, if, if that's not irritating for us to talk about, and especially since we don't know what, what we're, I don't know what I'm talking about with it, just, you know, what I've read. Um, but James' whole family had it, except for Henry, as far as I can tell. 
because uh, when you, you read about Henry's life, he was kind of calm and, and excited about what he was doing, but he never had the, the depressing lows that you see with every one of the other siblings. Um, uh, William had them uh, especially associated with bad backs, and his one sister, Alice, had them. And, and by the way, Alice's main companion was another woman. As a, you know, if that's, I, I mean, just tie that in. Uh, <laughs> kind of interesting. Um, uh, and, and the two youngest brothers both ended up being so ill that they ended up dying fairly young, um, in their 30s. Um, uh, but James suffered through it the same way his father did, and her fa his father associated it with a, uh, a, a, a evil in the world that was really depressing to him. And um, he was rescued, in a sense, by his uh, discovering a religion that he hadn't been a member of. He had been associated with um, the New England Unitarians uh, before. But what he discovered was um, Swedenborg, Emanuel Swedenborg. Have I mentioned him? The new church? Um, Swedenborg. Um, Do it this way. So Emanuel Swedenborg was a, um, a, a, a Swedish scientist that had a religious experience and became, uh, he said, a, a theologian creating his own religion. He was convinced that he was Jesus in the second coming. And I, I don't know if I've, I've mentioned that I there is a, um, a church uh, it's called the New Church and there, are, there for example was a chapel at Cambridge at Harvard at the time uh, and there was all I think and it's still there by the way uh, the, the biggest church uh, that, that I visited of that uh, religion was um, in Bryn Athen, there's the cathedral, which was built stone by stone uh, um, in an imitation of uh, uh, Westminster, I think, in England. So, so if you want to see Westminster Cathedral, you don't have to go all the way to England. You could just go to Bryn Athen, uh, Pennsylvania, and see an, an exact duplicate. By the way, it was built during the Depression. Uh, and as, as you would probably figure, uh, the, uh, um, the leaders of the church uh, were quite wealthy. And it seems to me, if you're familiar with the uh, Hollywood uh, religion, uh, that are lots of different actors and actresses that are members of Scientology, Scientology. Uh, you know, you know they, they seem crazy, uh, but they're also very re rich, and you wonder, you know, what the heck is the connection? That is an odd connection uh, with uh, uh, the Swedenborg church, the new church also. Um, in any case, um, by the way, I, I, I visited the bookstore there, and they were so pleased that somebody came into the bookstore. The lady gave me like ten books for free. You know, I didn't even have to buy them. Uh, I, you know, I took them home and I looked at them and I went, "This is crazy stuff." You know, you know, I've been talking with the angels, and the angels have told me, you know, by the way, they speak my language. The reason isn't because they speak a language; it's because when they're face to face and I'm engaged with them, I'm one with them mentally, and so I understand what they're saying, but what they're saying is actually my speech to them. Okay, so there you go. It's kind of interesting. But in any case, uh, Henry James Sr. Uh, entered into this and began writing lots and lots of books, um, uh, arguing uh, for this. William James um, is going to end up, especially during his, his 30s, trying to deal with his father's religion and not, not quite understanding what his father was, was trying to argue for. Um, 
And that irritated him because he wanted to understand his father and yet had trouble. But the father took the family to France, to England, to Germany, to Switzerland, to Italy, to Belgium, months at a time, all the little kids, etc., and got them into different schools because he kept looking for the 